we have Kevin D. Johnson. Kevin Johnson is the founder and president of Johnson Media Incorporated. He has several years of experience leading his company that serves many Fortune 100 businesses. As an innovative leader, he has appeared on CNN, ABC's Good Morning America, CBS, and the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. But before fi uh, founding his company, he developed computer software for leading companies such as IBM, CNN, and Accenture. So, so Haley, he, this is how it's written, hailing from Boston, Kevin attended Morehouse College in Atlanta, where he studied computer science as a NASA scholar in Spanish, uh, graduating with honors. He later obtained his MBA, MBA from MIT Sloan School of Business, no, Sloan School of Management, where he was a leadership fellow. He is currently a lecturer at M MIT and serves as a professional advisor for the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. And in his spare time, Kevin enjoys working with nonprofits, listening to salsa and jazz, playing the piano in his Latin band, reading, golfing, traveling, and running marathons. He published a best-selling book, The Entrepreneur Mind, which was featured on the best entrepreneurship book of all times, listed by Book Authority. So welcome, Kevin, to the platform. Thank you for having me. This is a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. So Kevin, today I want to introduce you to my co-host, uh, whose name is Kim, Kim Johnson. Uh, Kim will be helping me with the questions and sort of navigating some of the conversation that's going on tonight as well. Uh, she has been in corporate for uh, over 25 years in communications and consulting. She says she has a knack for strategic planning and drafting operational plans to determine future outcomes, which has aided her successfully in consulting with businesses and nonprofit organization. Um, she has been enlisted by several entrepreneurs, executive leaders and organizations to help with business developing development. She loves philanthropic work, such as mentoring youths and participating in diversity initiatives as well. Uh, she is the program manager for the Doctor of Education Computer Science Program at Judson University. And she's also a student of mine, my favorite student in the organizational <laughs> leadership program. So I just want to introduce Kim to the platform as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Kim. It, it seems like we have a lot in common. We do. Uh, just our last name. Yeah, absolutely. Our initials. I'm always, I'm always um, happy when I see somebody that has a K as a first name because that's not common. Yeah. Oh, you mean Karen is common? Let's not go there. <laughs> no, we're not common. K. Yep. You're part of the group. <laughs> I love to play on that day, but let's just get started. Kevin, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I, if I may, I, I want to give proper acknowledgement and thanks not only to you, but to my father who is joining us. And I imagine my mother might be listening. Uh, I am not who I am without them. So I first wanted to acknowledge them and, and say thank you for the, the influence uh, that they've had in, in my life. Um, so the biography was a little off in that I was born in Youngstown, Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> the problem is I can't tell you very much about Youngstown, Ohio. <laughs> I was born there, moved away from Youngstown when I was six, eventually moved to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I had a wonderful childhood through age six to 12, eventually moved to uh, Boxford, Massachusetts, which is about 40 miles north of Boston, Massachusetts. And that's really where I feel that I uh, matured the most, evolved the most, okay. and became who uh, I am today. So that's probably why the, the biography emphasizes my roots in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I became interested in computer science and the fascinating technologies that we now know uh, comprise the internet. Uh, in fact, uh, my father was very instrumental uh, in getting me interested in technology. In fact, I remember the day he brought home Prodigy, if, if some of you all can oh. remember Prodigy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, I can recite 
my login name to this day, MJWJ58C. And I can oh, say that because impressive. I don't I don't think anyone uses it anymore. So there's no <laughs> threat of hacking that account. But uh, went on to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where I studied computer science as a NASA scholar. Uh, and there I discovered entrepreneurship. In fact, I was supposed to go work at a NASA location, uh, whether it's JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, or another Goddard there in D.C. Uh, I didn't want to do that. And I was able to negotiate my way out of that so that I could pursue entrepreneurship. Fast forward uh, 20 years uh, plus, here I am with Johnson Media uh, also, I decided to torture myself and go back to school a few years ago to get my MBA. Uh, I had three goals, uh, one of which was to get the minimum degree in order to teach at uh, university. And it, it just so happened that a professor realized that I might be a good professor or a lecturer and said, hey, we have an opening. We think you'd be great for it. And so that was a blessing. Uh, and I took that opportunity. And it, I am currently a lecturer there, uh, teaching, building an entrepreneurial venture, advanced tools and techniques. So that's a little bit about me. And um, I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. And I feel like I'm in a really good place in my life. Uh, personally, I am a father. I have three boys, ages 10, 6, and 3, and a wonderful wife. Okay. Amen. Amen. Well, Kevin, you know, I wanted to ask you some questions. Um, so some things that really gleamed out in your book on the entrepreneurial mind and it, the very first one, thinking big, because you, you quoted this, this, this was a quote that was used. It says, going beyond the confines of the environment is one of the main obstacles to thinking big. So as you were building your business, I mean, you started as a sophomore in college when you started thinking, you, yeah, you began to frame your entrepreneurial concept and how you wanted to go about that. But tell me a little bit about that because when you have conversation typically with people, it's always about the confines of the environment. So how do you get past that mindset? That's a great question. And the reason I started with Think Big is because I noticed at Morehouse College, a lot of my peers were thinking small. Mm. And as I continue to mentor students uh, and recent grads, uh, that is a topic that comes up often. And I want to encourage, especially uh, people from our communities to think bigger. And a lot of times uh, our context dictate how big we think. Yeah. I saw a recent video of a, a woman, I, I can't recall her name, but she said, here's the difference between me, my world and Elon Musk. Elon Musk, the CEO and the founder of SpaceX, he dreams of going to Mars, right? So he, he feels that he has um, the ability to literally travel galactically or, or in our own universe, right? Where she says the confines of her environment, that's not even a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I realized on the campus of, of Morehouse College and some of the other HBCUs uh, a lot of students would come to me and say, you know, I would love to open up my own salon. Great idea. But why not think about opening or owning a chain of salons or creating some type of product or service that has a market as large as the United States or even the entire world? And so uh, that's why I started off with Think Big, because I saw over and over and over uh, students and recent grads were thinking small and operating well be below their, their maximum potential. Good. It's funny you would mention Elon Musk because he just put a quote out there, instead of having baby showers, why don't we have business showers, right? And provide the, the resources and the capital. I love that. I love that. To you go, boy. I love that because it makes sense, particularly, particularly with Black-owned businesses. If we could collectively put our resources together and build something greater, it is absolutely amazing. But I'm not going to stay on that topic. Now, you talked about the blue ocean. Oh, go ahead. If, if I might say something very quickly about that, you know, Iran is his own um, 
person. I'll put it that way. Uh, I do agree that the culture needs to change. And I'm exceedingly grateful for my parents who let me explore my entrepreneurial endeavors, right? So NASA scholar, you know, go get a job, start programming, work for IBM, work for NASA. Uh, and they gave me the latitude to explore my entrepreneurial dreams. And I think one of the unfortunate things that I'm running to consistently, especially as a lecturer now, is a lot of students are coming out with student debt. And so in order to service that loan, they go and get a job and they quell or squash their entrepreneurial G, uh, dreams. And so the culture is uh, go get a job, which is fine. You, you want to learn at somebody else's expense. But too often I find there are um, friends or family members that aren't particularly attuned to that type of culture and encouraging uh, people to pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. Yeah. I love what you said. You said formal education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you talked about uh, Peter Thiel, the, the co-founder of PayPal and the angel investor. I absolutely love that. Absolutely love it. Thank you for that. Yesterday, we were talking about um, marginalization and we were talking about the kids and and how we raise the kids and the messaging that we send to the kids, whether they are, will rise to that level of excellence or if they will stay as victims. And I shared with you how with my grandkids from the, the day they were born, they heard the word Mensa because that was the expectation. How important is that messaging uh, for our culture and particularly this younger generation? Yeah, the, the messaging is, is so important. Uh, coming from someone who runs a marketing and communications firm, I know that uh, intimately. You know, we, we talked about uh, how important it is to instill in our young folks a sense of confidence uh, that may not come from the mainstream. You know, I tell my kids, for example, to, to think differently, right? Don't necessarily take everything um, that uh, you, you learn in school. So, for example, uh, I tell them, you know, you have superpowers, right? You have skin that absorbs the sun, right? So you don't get burned. You have you have hair that defies gravity, right? And and they look at me and they say, "Put it that way," right? And so, you know, I, one of my favorite authors um, from Nigeria, um, she put it this way in one of her favorite TED talks: "It's important to have uh, and tell our own stories." Right. And I think um, from doing that, you learn from a different perspective. And from that comes the confidence of your own reality. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We um, I'm going to just transition over because I know that there are a lot of people who have questions for you. Um, when you said that um, you sh a bad economy is a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I want to tap into that just a little bit. What do you think about that when there's a bad econ uh, economy, particularly now with everything that's going on with the supply side and the economy and, um, you know, for the, for the doomers, is, we're going into seven years of famine. <laughs> and so even with that, how do you prepare for that? So can you just speak to that a bit? How yeah, do I, I talk about that in, that in my book. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's counterintuitive. I've heard Warren Buffett talk about this. He says, when people panic, I start buying. <laughs> so, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but it's very difficult because especially, I mean, you can take the pandemic, for example, a lot of people were uh, upset. Uh, mental health was an issue. And of course, that's important. But a lot of people go into um, seek opportunity mode. Right, Microsoft mm -hmm. was was created during a down economy. I believe IBM was also. So whenever you have these uh, life altering moments, that's the mm -hmm. time when you really want to try and uh, see what opportunities there are. You know, when yeah. when the pandemic hit, everyone thought the markets were going to tank. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought venture capital uh, was going to dry up. 
the exact opposite happened as it relates to venture capital. There's so much money out there right now. And what we saw was there was innovation around uh, telemedicine, telehealth, right? Yeah, Delivery awesome. services. So mm -hmm. the innovators, uh, those who could see the silver lining, um, got to work and it's paid off. Uh, IPOs, a lot of companies started going public um, and it really was the complete opposite of what people thought you know, was gonna happen. It was interesting because I did my research on nonprofits and, and, and fundraising sustainability, those strategies. And mm. in that research that was a Trinity, I, I interviewed my husband and we built a $4 million building that is still debt free. And also there was a, a nonprofit in Aurora that built a $10 million building. And so they yeah. talked about good stewardship and always keeping that vision out there, but you have to do something to move toward that vision. So it's always forward thinking and forward moving. Uh, you never should lose your vision despite right. you know, the immediacy of the circumstances. That's very good. Okay. Um, I, I love the story about your mom and your dad when you received a letter that you did not want to open. <laughs> get me in about trouble. About this job offering. <laughs> yeah, so uh, to give you the abridged version of, of the story, you know, I had a, a job offer. I think my junior year coming out of Morehouse to go to one of the big five consulting companies. It was big five then. I think it might be maybe down to big three or big two now. But, you know, that was the holy grail, right? If you get one of those consulting jobs, you take it, right? You, you, you had, um, they gave me an offer with an advance and, and a very, very good salary. And, you know, I put it away. Uh, and someone found it. I, I won't say any names, but one of my parents found it and, you know, say, hey, what, what is this? What's, what's going on here? What, are you, are you going to take this? And, you know, I said, no, I, I think I'm going to pursue entrepreneurship. And so um, though it was a difficult conversation, it was a quick one because I think my parents had confidence that whatever I chose to do, I would eventually be successful. So thanks to that, to them again for, for giving me the <laughs> attitude to do that. But uh, it's, it's funny to reflect on those times. I mean, they were scary times, right? If you recall, Enron had just blown up and uh, the economy was, was, was tanking. That was around the dot-com yeah. boom era. And so not a lot of students coming out of, at that time were getting jobs. Um, so there was a major risk, but luckily uh, I was able to, to, as you mentioned, stay focused on the vision. Stay focused on the vision. Absolutely. Was it Ted Turner who said his son, his son was not employed, so he didn't have a job. So therefore he was an entrepreneur. Was that Ted Turner from CNN? I, I think that I missed that one, that one, but that sounds like something <laughs> Ted Turner would say. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to just transition quickly over to is your, is this your business or your capstone? Kinetic, is that your business? Is that your new business? I wasn't sure as I was following the podcast and the case study. Yeah, so Kinetic is my business. It's a new initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. And it helps to solve one of the major problems I think we have currently, and that's the wealth gap. Uh, it, it kinetic, we envision a world where funding is available, accessible, and adequate for all people to pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. And I've read plenty of research provided by the Kauffman Foundation about just how large this wealth gap is and how that creates problems for people like me and you who, who want to start a business, right? Uh, we, are, we are well behind, uh, and it really starts with what's called or referred to as the friends and family round. Um, luckily, I had uh, parents who invested in me and, um, you know, were confident that, um, that I could pursue this dream and be confident, um, you know, moving forward. And so not a lot of families have the means to support their their children or to pursue an entrepreneurial dream so that's one of the problems uh big problems that uh, kinetic is trying to solve 
Okay. Um, I, I love in the case study how you went back and you talked about the Tulsa ma massacre and you talked about the Freedmen's Bank. Um, I, I did a little research. I was trying to figure out the president of the bank uh, before Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglass. I think his name was Lord Edward. Was he, oh, did he right. serve in the military? Was he, I wasn't sure about that whether the president was black or not. And there are no images of him out there. Right, I believe the original leaders of the Freedmen's Bureau or the, the bank were mm -hmm. uh, white. They brought in Frederick Douglass to, to clean it up. <laughs> Unfortunately, it yep. was uh, too late and he did, he put yep. in his own money, uh, mm -hmm. but eventually uh, the bank did fail. Uh, yes. through no fault of his own, but it was just too late. The original leaders of the bank uh, assumed that position through nepotism, uh, and they speculated on the deposits yeah. of many former slaves, and unfortunately, the bank failed. And, and that's yeah. what's created, I think, um, some of the mistrust in the financial sure. um, industry in the United mm -hmm. States, all the way up to, you know, uh, recent banks uh, taking advantage of, of our people. Yeah, 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 that that was unfortunate that happened. I, I was reflecting on my grandmother for who, when she died, there was like $15,000 under her mattress. She did oh, not wow. trust the banks at all. But it was that mindset, right? It was that mindset. But that, that was really interesting. And, and the Tulsa massacre, I did not realize that that happened within a day. Yes. One uh, day. One one day, uh, you know, it's it's such a a devastating period in our history. And what I found in doing my own research is that there are other cities in which similar things happen, similar atrocities happen. That is just one of of many. And so, uh, it's important that we share that history. In fact, uh, Harvard Business School requires that all incoming students read a uh, a case study on the Tulsa massacre. And so mm -hmm. uh, that it's so important. And what I love about it is students who uh, aren't African-American or are not of, of any um, intricate heritage are shocked. They had never heard of anything like this and they really mm -hmm. start to understand uh, why um, certain things are the, the, the way they are. You know, one of the, the, the books that I would love to encourage people to read is The Color of Money. That is a wonderful book where you can find uh, all this history. Um, I believe the woman's name is uh, Baradaran. Um, she's originally from, I believe, um, the Middle East, but she's just really got a grasp for African-American history and the intricacies of the history and how it affects us today. So definitely, I, I highly recommend the, the Color of Money, and then there's a, a related book, The Color of Law. Just excellent work. Okay. Oh, definitely. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm going to look tonight for those books. <laughs> I know that I've jumped all over the place, but the the, the main focus is black entrepreneurship and how do we. Uh, build into Black entrepreneurship in terms of having access to capital and money uh, despite the circumstances. And so I, I would love for you to just tap into that a little bit. And then I'm going to, it's pretty close to seven, then I'm going to let Kim come on with your questions. And then we will navigate the questions from the audience. Okay. All right. So the wealth gap in entrepreneurship. Very good. Yeah. The, I was listening to, um, I think his name is Don Peebles from New York, who's working on the affirmation tower, I believe it's called in New York City, and one of the leading African American um, businessmen right now. Um, and they talked about how the the gap, the wealth gap, is so large um, that we have so much work to do, and and it's a, it's a bit discouraging because it is so large and there's so much work to do, but we have to take very small steps, incremental steps to get there. And, and I think kinetic is part of that. But what I think is most important is bringing together our community, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship and leveraging the resources that we have within the community to continue to grow. Um, you know, there are those who want to continue 
seeking uh, reparations. I think that's important. But on the other hand, you know, it's important that we build uh, from within and use, you know, the relationships and the resources that we have. Good. Very good. All right, Ms. Johnson, Kim Johnson, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Love. Um, Kevin, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Uh, Dr. Love did invite me on because she knows that I love entrepreneurship. So it's very exciting to um, glean some of your wisdom. As you all were talking, I immediately thought of a statistic um, that I read. And I haven't um, confirmed this statistic, but I pulled it up really quick. In four months of the pandemic, 29 Americans became billionaires. Over 26 million Americans lost their health insurance. 46 million filed for unemployment. Billionaires incre increased their wealth by 584 billion. U.S. households lost some 6.5 trillion in wealth. And I know when people hear these statistics, a, a lot of people go toward the negative impact of the pandemic. When I saw this statistic, I was excited that in a pandemic, 29 Americans became billionaires. I don't know why, but it just brought excitement in me. And, you know, as you mentioned, one of the first steps in your book was to think big. So when entrepreneurs think they have to change their mindset, right, from an employee type of mindset to an employer type of mindset, um, I'm glad that Dr. Love brought up, you know, are there business opportunities during economic downturn? Because that was one of my questions and you address it in your book. Where would an entrepreneur or how would an entrepreneur or someone wanting to take this entrepreneurial journey, where would they begin to seek out such opportunities or how would they begin? Sure. I would, I would recommend two things. First, read a book. I'm, I'm a huge fan of reading. A lot of the knowledge that I gain about entrepreneurship came through books. In fact, I can recall the first book that I, I read called High Tech Startup. Uh, another one was about the um, uh, building and, and growth of Netscape. Um, if you can remember Netscape, that's quite a while ago. But I encourage <laughs> folks to go online as well. I mean, there's so many blogs now. One of the great things about the technology and the internet is that all of that knowledge is online. Uh, so I, I highly encourage people to go online. Second, there's this, this new zeitgeist around entrepreneurship. It's a little bit strange for me because I used to be one of a few and now I'm one of many, right? It seems like every school, every institution, uh, institute has an entrepreneurial division, which is great. Um, so I, I highly encourage folks to take advantage of incubators, of uh, all of these accelerators. There's, there's a plethora of programs out there. Um, another thing too, as opposed to 20 years ago, is it's so much cheaper to start now right? Um, to host your own website was uh, tremendously more um, 20 years ago, but now the cost of services and products is so low that it's very, very, very uh, realistic to, to start a business. So I, I encourage those two things. Find a book, read online, and then number two, take advantage of all of these new resources such as accelerators and incubators. Thank you for that. And sure. Um, a follow-up question to that is a lot of people have entrepreneurial desires and they may have even dipped their toes in entrepreneurial ventures and feel like they failed, right? Mm. So are failures any indication that one is not suited for business or can a budding entrepreneurial or entrepreneur learn or even grow from failure? That one is difficult. Right, I still have problems with with failure and some of the business ideas that have failed. But from that failure, you have so much that you can learn to propel you forward for the next idea. Uh, one of the great things about the San Francisco entrepreneurial ecosystem is that they have no qualms about sharing their failures. In fact, there's I think there's even a conference about failures where entrepreneurs get together and they talk about their failures so they you know they can learn from one another and i think that's a really great idea overall though that culture is not 
in every city um, around the world. And I think we have to do a better job of embracing failure um, so that we can learn to, to get to the next step. Interestingly, in talking to a lot of venture capitalists, they won't accept entrepreneurs or they won't fund entrepreneurs who haven't had a failure because they know that that second or third time around, they're going to be more likely to be successful based on what they learned from that failure. And so failure is very important. No one gets it right all the time the first time. And I think that's just something um, the entrepreneurial community has to grasp and has to um, embrace. Very good. Um, I know that there's a statistic that nine out of 10 businesses fail. And I remember someone told me, if you fail once, that means you have nine opportunities to get it right. <laughs> uh, that's one way of looking at it. So that's a that's an interesting perspective on that particular say, saying. And a lot, and oftentimes what we call a failure, it's really a precursor for success, right? That's true. So um, I do want to kind of segue um, into another topic about giving back. So how important is philanthropic involvement for entrepreneurs? Is giving of time and or resources beneficial for the business as well as the owner? Because we know we work so hard to achieve this American dream, but in this particular environment, as we talk about diversity, as we talk about building our community, as we talk about helping um, um, African-American entrepreneurs, how important is it for us to always remember and to give back? It's super important to give back for, for two reasons, just because it's the right thing to do, right? We've been so privileged. We've been so fortunate uh, to be where we are, um, even if that's just um, six, you know, not six feet under, right? We have so much to be thankful for. Uh, the second part of that is, and I always tell a lot of my mentees this, some of the best opportunities have come to me, have come to my friends and, and family through volunteering. Right. Um, I think there's a sh when when you're volunteering and you meet someone who has a shared interest, uh, you bond. Right. And it's, there's almost this instant acceptance that can pr help you uh, develop that relationship, whether it's just a friendship or ultimately a business relationship. Some of the biggest accounts I've gotten have come from volunteering for organizations where I've run into a director, a vice president or even a CEO who uh, sees me in the same situation giving back and they think, hey, that is someone who I'd love to do business with. And so I highly encourage people to give back, not only for that reason, but just because we're so privileged and, and it's the right thing to do. Very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and sharing um, this wisdom with us and encouraging budding entrepreneurs. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Kevin, I have a question for, for you. Uh, could you discuss the four-hour work week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the four-hour, yeah, Tim Ferriss is, is quite the guy, and I highly, highly recommend his podcast. He has some of the most engaging and profound uh, interviews, um, and he only does a few. I mean, he, he does a really great job of curating the people who he interviews. So, you know, the four-hour work week is this idea that you can minimize uh, the time that you work based on outsourcing a lot of the things that aren't central to your business or things that you, quite frankly, don't like to do, right? I mean, you could be the accountant for your business. You could be the virtual assistant. You, you can be all things, but it's not probably the most efficient way to get things done. And so um, the book that, that uh, Tim wrote and is continues to be a bestseller is, is very inspiring because it helps you get into that entrepreneurial frame of mind where you're outsourcing things and you're focusing on what's most important and perhaps what you're best at. The most frustrating thing is that you know you should outsource. That's the most efficient way but you don't have the resources or the funding, right? And, and so that's very, very frustrating. And so you become, you try to become as efficient as you can, as much as you know how, but you're still constrained to your limited knowledge in all processes. Yeah. So, And, and that's why I think that book was so mm -hmm. instrumental because it really told people like, it said, you can do this. 
And here's how you do it, right? You can outsource to Croatia or Canada where the dollar might go a little um, further. And so I think it really got people into this frame of mind that I can do it, even though I might have constrained resources. There are other um, resources out there that might might not break the bank. That's good. Uh, one more question before I open up the floor. I, I always tell my students that as soon as I start some type of venture, I'm thinking about my succession plan. Would you mm -hmm. advise that? Because I'm always thinking about training. You have to have that training and development in place. And I, Kim has heard it over and over and over again. But uh, would you recommend that? Uh, I, I Sometimes I think I say it too soon. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, if there's anything I've learned in life, I've learned that there are planners and then there's everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I commend you on, on that foresight. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's super important. I always tell my students, you know, have the end in mind, right? Are you going to exit? Yes. Do you want to grow the business, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you might be fired from the very board that you have to give account to. So you have yeah. to take into account all of these different things uh, and look far into the future. Far might be five years now, might be even be three at the pace of technology, but mm -hmm. it, it behooves you to give tremendous consideration to the future and, and planning ahead. Good deal. Good deal. Well, I'm going to open up the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I'm, I'm going to open sure. up the floor now to questions. I know, uh, that people are waiting to get in to ask, ask you some questions. So feel free. May I, may I ask one more question? And I'm sorry, I know I had my allotted time. Um, when it comes to funding a business, this is, this is one thing when I consult with business owners, how important is it to start a business using your own fund versus using other people's funds? Because mm. I know that, you know, you're starting up a business that's helping um, to raise capital for uh, I don't if I don't I don't know if it's exclusively my minority owned business, but during this time, especially because of some of the um, racial unrest that we've had in the last couple of years as of the pandemic, there seems to be a um, demand that businesses start to patronize. I know there was a 15 percent initiative where certain businesses were um, called upon and put on the spot like 15 percent of the um, um, products that you carry should come from minority owned, specifically African American owned businesses. So right. if you could speak to because the venture capital, right? Um, that's one of the things that's in your bio. Right. This, this is a big topic. I mean, everyone's talking about venture capital. Uh, and it's, it's exciting. Um, and, you know, this conversation started shortly after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, in fact, a lot of people were skeptical. I mean, how do you go from the murder of George Floyd to we need more venture capital for black businesses, right? That To me, that's a huge jump, but it, it is all related because it, it comes down to economic opportunity and, and the, 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 the funds uh, and the economics that come to our community that, that relate to policing. Uh, that's a different topic for, for another day. But what I tell my students uh, especially my, my students of color, uh, the best way to fund your business is customers, right? And so don't get caught up too much in all of this talk about venture capital, because when you look at the businesses that we start, a lot of them are not necessarily the hockey growth, um, high tech, high growth companies, Right. And so a lot of our, our businesses are small and medium size. And so there are going to be different mm -hmm. sources of capital that uh, suit those type of businesses. You know, the, the major way or the, the most common way that our businesses are funded is through credit cards. Um, and that's mm -hmm. just the population in general. And a lot of people don't realize they go straight to other types of funding, um, mm -hmm. you know, business lines, um, you know, your, your own personal fund. So I encourage folks to get customers, right? Cause th that revenue coming in is, is most important. But secondly, you know um, you got to have some skin in the game, right? There's always sweat equity, the work that you put in um, investors like to see that you've put in some work, whether it's building the product or service or actually putting in your own money. Um, but, you know, I always, 
tell people to try to avoid taking investors as long as you can, because the earlier that you take on money, the less equity that you will, you know, you'll own. So uh, even though there's, a, though there's a lot of excitement about getting funding, um, try to hold off on that conversation as long as you can, because if you uh, give up or go after, you know, funds early, that means you've got to give up more equity. Uh, in the long run. So that's just a little bit about, about how I approach it. Um, but most of all, you've got to think about what type of business you have and what the growth projections are, because venture capital doesn't suit everybody. In fact, it's it suits a very small percentage, right? Interesting. Okay. Very, very good. good. Thank you so much. I feel like we're truly cousins after having this conversation. So thank you, cousin. <laughs> hey, you're welcome, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Hi, this is Terry. Can I ask a question? Dr. Stein, Hi, absolutely. Terry. Hi, thank you so very much for joining us. It's a pleasure sure. and a blessing. Um, and it's always wonderful when you give your parents credit for what you've done. We talk about this quite frequently in terms of being able to pay it forward. So my question really looks at the psychology of entrepreneurship if you will, mm -hmm. and speak to, if you will, maybe basic characteristics. What are some of those things that uh, will make you naturally motivated to keep going? Because as we've uh, pointed out, there will be failure. That's a part of any process. So give us some characteristics, things that one should look to strive to be like. Sure, I think one of the most common characteristics that entrepreneurs have is this sense um, of a need for autonomy, right? Um, and how can I put this in a good way? I think most entrepreneurs, they, they, they want their own time. They want to do their own thing, right? I, I recall growing up watching Sesame Street, there was a segment of the show, you know, one of these kids is doing his own thing, right? You see them dancing in the box. That, that's me. <laughs> that's, those are the entrepreneurs. They, they want to do their own thing, um, even though there might be great risk. And so uh, if you have a sense of autonomy, you, you enjoy getting up uh, when you want to get up, right? And, and setting your own schedule, um, that is a very, very strong characteristic that a lot of entrepreneurs have. Uh, another characteristic is grit, right? There is a, um, a book uh, written by Angela Duckworth, I think her name is, on grit, right? And just the meaning of grit and how important it is to have grit, stick to I've heard someone call it. But just being able to get back up and get back out there because even though your business might, might not fail, there might be situations when you think your business is going to fail, but just around the corner, there's there's a breakthrough. And so you've got to have that tenacity to hang on. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll end with the, the third one. Uh, there's the leadership piece, right? Being able not only to lead others, but also to lead yourself. That's one that I struggled with early on, right? There's, there's, there's joy in having that autonomy, but if you can't lead yourself, Right. If you don't have the self-discipline to do what it takes to um, uh, have a successful business, then it's probably not for you. And, you know, there is this idea that when you have your own business, you're your own boss. I would say that's not very true because ultimately mm. the customer is your boss. And if you don't, you know, uh, give the customer what he or she wants, then you're going to be out of business. So those are just three characteristics that I think are, are super important to, to be a successful entrepreneur. Very good. Very good. Mithun, I know he has a question. <laughs> Call him out. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Love. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for all the uh, resourceful information that you've provided so far. Sure. Um, I was actually going to mention grit, but you just mentioned it. Um, I have grit basically written on my dashboard in my room that basically says, just keep chasing your dream, don't give up, and then just stick to it. And, you know, you might take two years, four years, or five years to uh, achieve that dream, but it's important that you stick to it, uh, which kind of takes me back to as you mentioned about thinking big and then people, uh, students basically after they graduate, they just have to take up jobs so that they are able to pay back their student loans and everything. Um, I don't you think it's kind of difficult at that moment when you are just young in the market, you might be starting a family to really 
think big, but rather have small steps to be able to reach maybe to a bigger dream at a later point in your life. I agree wholeheartedly. You know, the older we get, the more responsibilities th that we have and, and the more difficult it becomes to, to, to dream big. But I, I think the incremental approach works well. Uh, one of the things that I, I tell students who uh, have to go do their time, so to speak, uh, two or three years or what have you, consulting to pay back loans, et cetera, uh, is make sure when you take a job, that you are learning while you're on that job um, and learning things that will help you to attain your dreams, right? If I wanna own a hotel, it's probably not gonna be in my interest to uh, do something that's not related to running or, or you know, operating a hotel, right? Mm -hmm. If I wanna own a hotel, the best job for me would probably to go would probably be to go work at a hotel, right? Because you're learning the business on somebody else's dime and you're minimizing the risk, right? So make it make sense. Uh, of course, we all have responsibilities and, you know, the, the dream might be uh, a little farther um, off. But as you mentioned, take those incremental steps, but make sure those steps make sense and relate to the overall big dream. That's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. That's Thanks. very excellent. Thanks. Yeah, good. And congratulations, by the way. I heard you're up for an award. So <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> Thank you. It's a lot of hard work and sweat. Yeah. <laughs> you deserve it, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Thank you. This has been uh, beyond phenomenal, man. We've uh, all benefited from uh, your your great expertise. So. Um, the last segment or last question was a great segue, I think, to mine. I'm in a franchise business, and I love it. It's taught me a lot. There are some things I want to do when I finish this um, where I'll step out on my own without a franchise. So just give me – can you give us your opinion on franchising, if if not the, the ultimate uh, business uh, model for you, but as a kind of a proving ground, kind of a stepping stone to teach you the, the different aspects of business – so that you're successful when you step out on your own. Yeah, it, 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 interestingly, I was just talking to uh, the folks at corporate McDonald's and and uh, working on some projects to bring the the whole franchise family into this conversation about entrepreneurship. I know a lot of uh, schools, uh, a lot of people leave them out, but I, I think it should be part, especially when you're talking about funding, because a lot of the franchises have really unique ways that they have been funded, whether it's through family, whether it's through leveraging loans. I mean, it, I think it all helps uh, for that entrepreneurial um, uh, discussion. Again, I am, I am a huge supporter of franchises and that whole model, because you can learn uh, so much before you eventually go out and do your own thing, right? Um, you learn the system, you learn uh, the unit economics, right? You, you, and you can learn with having the support of someone else, right? Um, and, and someone that's created systems, that's created efficiencies that you can then use to um, create whatever it is that you want ev eventually down the line. So I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of it. Uh, and I encourage folks to pursue that if it's for them, right? Not everybody can be an entrepreneur. I have a good friend of mine, and you might know of the Bronner brothers. He he said uh, recently, he said, if everybody's going to be an entrepreneur, who's going to work? Like, <laughs> right? We have all this <laughs> excitement about start your own business. But eventually, somebody's got to, you know, work for somebody else, and you've got to have customers. So I thought that was was pretty funny coming from, from him. But uh, again, yes, I, I highly encourage folks to pursue uh, franchises if that's that's for you. Yeah. And, and Kevin, as a, an aside, I don't know if you heard, but McDonald's has set aside like five million dollars uh, to support folks who traditionally don't have the funds to start a business. So if you have students who have a desire to like McDonald's, uh, there's a great opportunity and the window is kind of like right now to uh, to pursue a McDonald's franchise. So yes, I, I saw that and I think we're on the, the same same page with what you know trying to get the word out about those funds and and get 
you know, uh, those who are well qualified and interested in pursuing those funds. So thanks for, for that reminder and mention. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Can I slip one in here, mommy? Yes. Yeah. Kevin, thank you. for This, this has been great. <laughs> it's been great to see you, son. This is outstanding. Thank you. I'm going to try to see if I can compact a couple of things if I can. Um, All right. So uh, the one thing is, uh, the one piece is, this is from a conversation that, I don't know if Michael's tuning in here, but the conversation that we've had is along the, along, how to, along the lines of how do we begin to help develop a pipeline educationally and preparationally of people who are moving into those areas that you actually talk about, venture capitalism, uh, you know, his focus is really is on consulting and investment banking and private equity. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit of your thoughts about that from an educational standpoint. And secondly, um, the, the, a part of what we're doing through the foundation, through the Love Foundation, is we, 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 we'll be setting up centers. We got the Elgin Center and in the Rockford Center out here where we're going to be doing a lot of focus on uh, dealing with not only the educational but the vocational and and the uh, incubator components as a part of our education and, and, and one of our sites, the part of our educational component there. And I'd just like to get just a little bit of your thinking on, on each of those components, if you don't mind. Just, just grab any piece of that you feel comfortable with. Sure. You know, I, I'm, I'm excited about the current times because a lot of those pipelines are being created. Um, a lot of people are understanding the need to have um, people in places that can fund the businesses that normally get overlooked, right? And so we need to have people who are trained in venture capitalism uh, and private equity to get into those places of influence uh, and make those decisions that are so important. I'll give you a, an example. In uh, Massachusetts, there was a woman who uh, was pitching to several investors. And I think her, her business was a, was a hair care product, right? And, and we know within our communities, that is a very important uh, industry, right? I just mentioned the Bronner brothers, you know, that, that is a huge industry. But if you're pitching to people who cannot relate to that, right? They're going to see that as a huge risk, no matter how much money you're making, because they don't understand the business. It took someone in uh, a position of influence, a black woman who said, this is a brilliant idea. We need to fund this, right? So having her at the, the table, who's more than qualified and, 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 and sees the opportunity in this business, she can say, all right, let's fund this. And, um, you know, that's, that's, there should be more of that, right? And so there are organizations like Black VC, uh, organizations, I think HBC, UVC, that are really doing great things now that, that are fairly new, that are training uh, recent grads uh, and even current students on this whole industry of venture capitalism and private equity. Because quite frankly, it is an exclusive group. Oh, yeah. You know, it, yeah. it took me a while, and I'll be completely transparent, just to get the jargon. And a lot of these concepts are very basic, right? But they can, like many other industries, they can tell who's in and who's out just based on how you talk, right? <laughs> the, the different terms that you use. And so mm -hmm. the education is so key to getting people in those positions of influence who can say, yes, we need to fund uh, you know, the loves project. We need to, we need to fund Kevin's project, right? We, mm -hmm. so, um, the numbers are increasing. They're incremental. They're slow. Uh, they're slowly getting there, but, um, I think you're on the, on the right path and that the education is so important to be able to place, uh, well-qualified people in those positions of a uh, partner, right? We're talking partner level, yeah. managing partner, and then even uh, at the level of what's uh, called the limited partner, those who are writing the checks to the people who can write the checks, right? Wow. You know, normally, these are state institutions, uh, large insurance companies, right? And so we're, we're more and more getting in those positions of influence where we can, um, uh, you know, support our, our businesses, um, and rightly so. Thank you. I know that the a little long-winded there, but 
Uh, I hope that answers your question. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Well, I, it, it is 727 and I would be remiss to not to dismiss this uh, session and not have your family speak into the session, Kevin. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> so they have the floor. <laughs> what? Good afternoon. We're, we're, Good afternoon. we're proud of you, Kevin. Kevin, uh, son number two. <laughs> uh, and um, I would like to say that uh, I've been in and out because I've been watching the grandkids while my husband sit here and, and perform on TV, I guess you say. <laughs> uh, hello, Patricia. Welcome back. Um, I'd like, just like to say that it was um, a very good um, a meeting, and I, I learned something every time someone says anything about education. Um, again, um, thank you, and God bless all of you. Bless you, you too. It's good to see uh, you. I'd just like to say um, thanks, Kevin, for not listening to us and taking that job off. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you uh, know what happened. Right. Oh, we, we forgive so you for not taking it. it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we're really proud of you. We thank all of um, the participants that have shown up. I see we have representations from multiple states here on this uh, um, Zoom this evening. So not to uh, belabor the time, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. And, you know, I didn't get to finish that story, but, you know, had I taken the job, I would have been fired a few months later when uh, Ed Ron and Arthur Anderson went down. So. Oh. Right. <laughs> protection, protection of the Lord there, Kevin. <laughs> foresight, foresight. Well, Kevin, as as we close out, there was a section in your book called To Love Your Life, and you, you talked about those incredible experiences you've had. So I would love for you to share those experiences with us as we close out. You said the... I to love your something. life. Mm-hmm. Some of the places you've been, some of the experiences oh, you've had, yes. Yeah, I, I think the most recent one is is uh, Israel. Just getting back from Jerusalem, I had a wonderful time there. I was there uh, studying the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Israel uh, mm -hmm. and understanding how they've been able to grow so many businesses, so many unicorns in such a small time and with such a small population. Uh, but the highlight was definitely Jerusalem and getting to see um, uh, and walk the, the, the Via Dolorosa, the, you know, where Christ uh, walked. And, and um, that, that was just phenomenal. You know, there's, it's one thing to read the parables in the Bible, uh, but there's another, uh, it's another thing to actually walk uh, and be and see where all these things happen. So, uh, and, and, and I can say this is part uh, and thanks to what I do, right? And so yeah. it, that was one of the blessings, highlights of, of my life, being able to do that. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'm, I'm not gonna go over my time because I don't want you to send me a bill. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been an incredible experience. And I thank everyone for tuning in on this on this this Zoom call. Um, he will be um I will upload the video on um YouTube and there will be a podcast link as well. So that should be coming out before Sunday. But thank you everyone for joining in on Friday night chats. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so thank for you. that wealth of information that you provided. Thank you, Kim, for co-hosting as well. And God bless everyone. And I want to Amen. say good night. Awesome. Kevin. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, thank you. That was a delight. I appreciate everybody being on. Oh, it, it was an incredible experience. I, I really love just sharing to hearing your stories and and reading the case studies and listening to the podcasts. That was amazing. And I'm still learning, trying to learn the terms and just glean from <laughs> your experiences. It's incredible. It is incredible. Oh, yeah. Ex excellent. Hey. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, and thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> did a great job. Good to see you, yeah. Johnsons. <laughs> <laughs> see ya.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.